Kira Yamato seemed like all his other friends. But he has a secret. You did betray your own people, didn't you? And a deadly talent. I also happen to be a coordinator. A genetically enhanced coordinator. Kira possesses abilities far beyond his earthly friends. There's no reason why I have to do any of those things. Cast as protector and conqueror. Kira is unsure of either role. But that doesn't mean I can fight in battle. It's time. Battle lines are drawn, and a new war emerges. Here they come. All hands, level one battle stations! Kira finds himself facing down an enemy he doesn't hate. We don't want anything to do with your war! And championing a cause he doesn't understand. Why can't you go away and let us live in peace? As after the Earth forces face off, Kira and his Gundam may be Earth's only hope. I'm not about to be defeated here! Or the harbinger of its demise. Failure is not an option. It's coming. Portside Valiant, fire! Well, here we are. It's been a bit, but I'm back and happy to finally share my thoughts on one of the most requested and probably most polarizing entries into the Gundam franchise. Mobile Suit Gundam Seed originally aired in 2002, and honestly, I'm surprised it took them that long to truly fuse the genres of mecha warfare and daytime TV soap opera together. Yes, the word of the day today is going to be drama. Melodrama, specifically. If you were to turn the amount of times that someone cries big crocodile tears in Seed into a drinking game, well, you would probably get alcohol poisoning, so maybe actually don't do that. This show has a little bit of everything, including family drama, love triangles, romantically being stranded on a desert island and almost drowning in a tide pool, love quadrangles, love trapezoids? Mobile Suit Gundam Seed is a full 50 episode series, although I watched the HD remaster version, which cuts out to recap episodes, as well as changing the context of some pretty important scenes. People on both sides of the fence gave their opinion on which version I should watch, and in the end, the HD remaster came out on top, which is nice because the original SD airing of the show is kinda hard to find, even on a VPN, if you know what I mean. This is where I'd put an ad if I was an important YouTuber. You hear me, VPNs? My wallet is open. Now, I did keep the changes between the two versions in mind, and I'll discuss them when they come up, but if I miss anything, feel free to let me know, because there's a ton of information on Gundam Seed online. Which really shouldn't be all that surprising, Gundam Seed was a record-breaking seller and remains one of the most popular settings of the entire franchise. A terrible sequel notwithstanding. Only two years after Seed's release, the series would sell over 1 million copies in Japan on DVD, with the first volume alone selling over 100,000 units. Not only that, but when Gundam Seed was licensed for distribution to the West in 2004, it was the biggest hit over here since Wing. Of course, this success brought further opportunities to make that sweet, sweet cash. And a sequel series that was regarded as a pretty big letdown was released alongside a special movie version of Gundam Seed only a few short years later. Spin-offs, light novels, and manga aplenty would release for years after Seed's initial run. It truly was a good time to be a fan of the franchise, if you could stand all of the crying, that is. <laughs> Mobile Suit Gundam Seed begins by setting the scene of the year 71 of the Cosmic Era. Of course, war has broken out among the various factions of humanity, residing both in space and on the Earth. On one side is the Earth Alliance, a federation of Earth-based states that all have their own goals and ambitions throughout the series. 
On the other side is the Zodiac Alliance of Freedom Treaty, or ZAFT for short, which is essentially a one-party dictatorship that has ownership of this series' space colonies that Gundam Seed calls plants. In the middle of these two powers is a neutral nation known as the Orb Union, a country located on a set of islands in the South Pacific. It's basically Japan, and due to using the island's geothermal energy to become completely energy independent, Orb has become a rich and resourceful land of peace. The major conflict between the two main factions of Gundam Seed is the existence of bioengineered humans, known as coordinators. Coordinators are smarter, have better reflexes and intelligence than regular humans, and are better suited to living in space. Naturally, this leads to resentment from the Naturals and a anti-coordinator terrorist cell known as Blue Cosmos is born. Along with the fact that a large portion of Zaf's leadership are coordinator supremacists that want to straight up commit genocide on the Naturals, yeah, it's not a very cheery outlook. Eleven months before the outset of the show, an event known as the Bloody Valentine Incident happens. The terrorist group Blue Cosmos, who have members within the Alliance, use a nuclear missile to destroy the colony of Junius 7. In response, Zaft developed a technology known as N-Jammers, which are able to disable nuclear power. Due to nuclear weapons being off the table and mobile suits being fairly new weapons that only coordinators can successfully pilot due to their superior reaction time and reflexes, the Federation is fighting a war of attrition that has become incredibly bloody. We meet our main character, Kira Yamato, 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 Tomato, Tomato. Zap forces have advanced to areas within six kilometers of Gaosheng. Don't look now. So, no, this is where you're hanging out. A university student studying engineering on the ore-boned plant of Heliopolis. Kira joins his group of friends, Sai Argyle, Mirialia, Toll, and another kid named Goddamn Cuzzy Buzzkirk, which is amazing. Does your computer have Minecraft on it? No. What about Five Nights Freddy's? Definitely not. Oh, there's also Flay Ulster, the school rich girl who's in a weird sort of arranged engagement with Psy because of a business deal between their fathers, yet space capitalism strikes again. The group go and talk to their teacher, and mysteriously there is a blonde-haired person standing ominously in the corner of the room who's said to be a special guest of the professor. It doesn't take long for the quiet lives of the students to become intertwined in the war, however, as a team of Zaft operatives infiltrate the colony. Commanded by Gundam Seed's resident Char clone, Rao La Crusade, the aptly named La Crusade team plants a bunch of bombs around the harbor, launching an attack on the Orb Company facility known as Morgan Road. It looks like a neutral nation like Orb pulled a big ol' oopsie and kinda sorta developed top secret weapons for the Earth Alliance? You guessed it, the target of the Zaft team is a set of Gundam-class mobile suits known as G-Weapons in Universe. They are specifically designed to give the natural humans a way to combat the Coordinator mobile suits. Too bad all their test pilots are killed and four of the five suits are stolen in the opening episode. Yeah, talk about Gundam having a problem with mobile suits being stolen all the time, here it happens in bulk. Kira ends up shoving the mysterious stranger into an escape shelter after leaving his group to save them, but with only one space left, he's left outside. While making their way to the shelter, the two come across the series' main mobile suits, and she exclaims, Father, what have you done? Father, I know you betrayed us a lot! Enemy predator hmm? missile incoming! Oh, oh baby! So, she'll be an important character later then. Anyway, into the shelter with you. After looping back around to find safety, Kira sees the series parallel of Captain Bright Noah, Mariu Ramius fending off Zaft soldiers near the only remaining mobile suit. Kira decides to help, and when the Zaft soldier Athrun Zala gets close enough to see him, he recognizes Kira as his childhood friend who he hasn't seen in years. How very sweet it in two of you, Gundam Seed. <laughs> Athrun
Catherine runs off, leaving Kira and Ramius to power on the leftover mobile suit, the GAT X105 Strike Gundam. Ramius is injured and also just a natural, so she leaves Kira to take the pilot seat of the experimental mech. It's revealed that Kira is a coordinator, living on the neutral colony of Heliopolis with his parents to avoid the war. He makes short work of the Zaft Jin, blowing it up inside the colony. I have to say the designs of not only the Gundam suits in Seed, but also the designs of their various grunt suits are pretty top tier. I think it's pretty telling that anytime you see a conversation online regarding Gundam Seed, even the people hating on it usually say the mechs look great. The Strike Gundam itself works well as a parallel to the original RX-78, kind of like when you see those posts online of manga artists drawing each other's characters. Kira's friends show up and they're all like, oh wow, Kira, you sure are good at giant roboting, and then Ramius wakes up and shoots at them, saying that the Strike is super duper extra classified, and now she has to take them all prisoner. Huh? Ah! Huh? Hey, what do you think you're doing? Please, just stop all this. Stop right there, criminal scum. Nobody breaks the law on my watch. In case you haven't noticed, we're citizens of I'll have your head, you filthy lord! Which I'm pretty sure is a war crime, because they are citizens of a neutral sovereign nation, but it's Gundam, so that's probably the least serious war crime we're about to see. Along with the experimental suits is a ship built for housing them. Designated the Archangel, this mobile suit carrier launches during the chaos of the attack on Morgan Road's facility, and zeroes in on Kira's location. We meet both Commander Mula Flaga, a confident and handsome mobile armor pilot, and Ensign Natarl Bajaral, a by-the-book soldier who serves as the first mate aboard the Archangel and is in charge of the ship's CIC. It would seem that most of the ship's crew were killed in the attack, along with the original pilots intended for the experimental suits. Because those pilots bit the dust, Ramius asks Kira to pilot the strike so that they can evacuate the colony. It's a pretty clear parallel to how Amaro started in the original series, though we see in Seed, Kira is set up to be special from the very beginning. La Flaga outs Kira as a coordinator to everyone right at the start of the series, and they're honestly all pretty cool with it, except for Flay, but more on that later. Where Amaro became special over time as his new type powers gradually developed, Kira is immediately shown to be above everyone else on an almost supernatural level. A lot of people will call Kira a Mary Sue, and while yeah, I think that is a pretty apt description, especially in the later half of the show, it's mostly an intended part of the narrative instead of an author insert crutch. Though I have to admit, there is a fair amount of bullshittery involved. The colony breaks apart as the Archangel escapes, and after arguing about military protocol, the ship takes on a lifeboat full of civilians that they find floating in the debris. Inside the capsule is Flay, much to Sai's surprise. Kira is in the Gundam main character phase of not wanting to pilot the Gundam because he really shouldn't have to, and yes, Kira is right in this instance. But I like how this show uses the Flaga to just bluntly lay out the alternative. He's just like, well, alright, I, I guess we'll just all die then. And you can say that's manipulative, it certainly is, but it works, so checkmate, I guess. The fact that Kira's friends all decide to fill in positions on the bridge instead of just sitting around and awaiting their fate also helps Kira's decision to become a pilot as well. Kira decides here to fight for his friends, and this becomes his driving motivation for a pretty large portion of the show. Kira defends the Archangel alone against the La Crusade team, which consists of Athrin, Dirka, Izak, and Nicole, a group of ace pilots who are operating the stolen Gundams. Also, uh, before anyone says anything, I know some of the dubs pronounce Dirka Diarka, and I haven't seen the sub, but in the HD ra remaster, he's pronounced Dirka, so I'm sticking with that. And then Nicole, I, I, I guess it's it's Nicole, so sorry, uh, again, disclaimer, bad at pronouncing, go ahead and yell at me, I don't care. During the battle, Athrun reveals to Kira that his parents were killed in the Bloody Valentine incident, which is why he fights for Zaft, and he desperately wants Kira to come with him. La Flaga saves Kira from being brought back to the Zaft ship, 
and the Archangel makes it to the Eurasian controlled base of Artemis. Here it is illustrated to the audience that the Earth Alliance is filled with a bunch of scheming, backstabbing bastards who would probably be fighting each other if it weren't for Zaft. The Archangel is docked inside Artemis, which is pretty much impenetrable due to a huge energy shield. While they may appear to be safe, the Archangel crew is detained as the Commandant of Artemis attempts to find the pilot of the strike. After a suggestion from La Flaga, Kira had to put a lock on the mech's operating system, so that the only one who could operate it is him. While the Archangel crew deals with the Commandant being a total dick, Nicole of the La Crusade team believes that the Blitz Gundam's stealth capabilities can get himself inside the base while the shield is down. I think that out of all the G-Weapon suits in this show, the Blitz is actually one of my favorites. I mean, the Strike is number one in my mind for the first half of the show, but I can't help but love that dark color scheme. It's funny that the edgiest looking Gundam design is piloted by the most likable and relatable Zaft pilot, Nicole Amalfi. Just a green-haired boy who sure does love playing the piano and doesn't want anything too bad to happen to him, yes siree. Inside the base, Flay blabs to everyone that Kira is a coordinator, which the present Alliance leadership finds very interesting. They try to force him to release the lock on the Strikes OS, but the base comes under attack by Nicole, and Kira along with the Archangel and all of the crew are able to escape the base during the chaos. Kira fights Nicole outside the base, but is unable to stop him and Artemis explodes. The Archangel is now critically low on supplies, so they decide to scavenge from the debris belt orbiting the Earth. There are mixed feelings about this, because treading upon the Junius 7 colony, the place that was destroyed in the bloody Valentine incident, is seen as taboo. Especially when they're going there to resupply, a lot of the crew see this as grave robbing. Unfortunately, Hello there. the Archangel can't even resupply at a damaged colony without a fight as they come across a zapped ship and Jin mobile suit. Kira takes down the suit and here's where he shows some signs of struggling to be able to kill. Personally, I don't think it's done as well as with Amaro back in the original series, but to give the writers of Seed credit, they had a different vision for who Kira would become, so they just kind of speedrun his PTSD arc for better or for worse. The Archangel recovers a lifeboat floating in the debris, and inside we're introduced to Lacus Klein, a character who I think is actually kind of underrated. I'll admit at first I didn't really like Lacus. I thought she was just an addition to Kira's prospective harem that they were setting up, but I can proudly say that I was very wrong about that. Also, I keep wanting to pronounce her name Lacus, so if I do that, I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure that's a type of potato pancake, so... Sorry, Lacus. In any case, Lacus starts out being introduced to the viewer as a idol from the Zaft homeland and daughter of the Zaft leader, Chairman Siegel Klein. Not only that, but she also happens to be Athrun's fiance in a weird arranged marriage situation. That will actually come back later in more ways than one. And yeah, while Mobile Suit Gundam Seed is certainly a soap opera teen romance aimed at the older teen audience, its writing is actually a little bit better than a lot of people give it credit for. Don't get me wrong though, it's not Shakespeare, it's like 250 monkeys on a typewriter tops. We learn that Lacus was in the debris belt to perform a memorial service for the destroyed colony of Junius 7. While this area is supposed to be under a ceasefire as a form of respect, an alliance ship requested to inspect their ship and then a fight broke out on board. So now the Archangel has a very important hostage, and the crew is pretty split on what to do with her. And Zin Bajeral remarks that it's their sworn duty as Alliance soldiers to bring her to HQ as a hostage, while La Flaga and Ramius along with the younger crew members don't like the prospect of using a civilian in that manner. On the other side, the Zaft High Council is pretty pissed that Lacus has been captured, as she's incredibly good for morale, so they assign the La Crusade team to retrieve her, with Atherin at their helm. These few episodes also do a lot to give Flay some characterization, and um... 
If I said she wasn't one of the most hated characters in all of the Gundam franchise, I would be lying. Flay is pretty much a spoiled rich kid thrust upon a military ship with absolutely no idea what she should do or what that would be like. So her attitude is abrasive when compared to the rest of the crew of the Archangel, who kind of understand the gravity of the situation that they're in. She's also pretty racist against coordinators, like she calls the Coos creepy and refuses to bring her her lunch at one point. Even before that, she would just like openly talk about how she hated coordinators with Kira just standing right there. The point is, Flay is set up so that the audience won't really like her, and that's before she becomes a super manipulative psychopath. The Archangel receives a message from the 8th Lunar Fleet, and it would seem that the day might be saved. A small group of resupply ships show up in order to help the Archangel, but so does the La Crusade team, who open fire in an effort to regain Lacus. Oh, also, Flay's dad is on board one of the resupply ships because he's an important Alliance politician, which seems kind of risky given how fragile the ships are shown to be in the Cosmic Era. Ahoy, Captain Romius. I'm just calling to tell you good job on managing the civilians and escaping the La Crusade team. Can you... Sorry, it's it's hard to hear. Can, can you stop doing that? As I was saying, we'll be sending you a ship to pick up the... Okay, please, put just put the drink down. And don't stop. Don't do it again. God, I hope I blow up. I also want to point out, this is where I started noticing some oddities in the HD remaster. Some scenes seem really blurry, with the line work looking really weird. Like, some kind of smoothing filter was applied over it. I can only assume that this is because the HD remaster zooms in on the original frames to achieve its 16x9 aspect ratio. Much like the original DVD releases of DBZ, it's, it's pretty noticeable, especially when you're watching it on a big TV. Anyway, during the battle, Flay goes cuckoo and takes Lakus hostage, taking her to the bridge and threatening to kill her if Zaft forces attack the ship that her father is aboard. Now, she doesn't have a gun or a knife, and I doubt the bridge crew would just stand there and watch her strangle Lakus to death, but it's the thought that counts. Just as Flay is done issuing her threat to the bridge, the ship that her father is on explodes, and Badgerol grabs the comm unit, broadcasting the threat that they have Lacus on board to the zapped ships that are nearby. La Crusade orders the attack to cease, and then the outro plays as the show transitions to credits. I love how often and how well this show is able to overlay its outro songs with the final scenes in the episode. It really gives the dramatic moments of the show a good send-off every time. Kira, along with Sai and Mirialia, don't feel super great about keeping Lacus as a hostage and decide to give her back to Zaft using the strike. We get our first glimpse that something's obviously wrong with La Crusade, as he's required to take pills every day. Maybe he has arthritis. Flay grieves for her father and lays the blame squarely on Kira's shoulders for not being able to protect the ship. <laughs> When Kira and Athrin finally meet face to face, Athrin asks him to come back to Zaft and be with his people, but Kira has decided to fight for his friends on the Archangel, coordinator or not. They part ways after exchanging custody of Lacus, promising that the next time they meet, they'll defeat each other on the battlefield. Kira is immediately put on trial for these actions, and Ramius tells him that normally he would be put to death for doing what he did, but since Kira is a civilian and not beholden to a military tribunal, he gets off scot-free. Badgerol looks pretty peeved that she can't execute him, might want to get that bloodlust checked, Ensign. This is where Flay starts to come into her own as a character, and where a lot of viewers start to really hate her. And, I mean, you really are supposed to. She begins to manipulate Kira by telling a little kid he'll make sure she's safe, and she enjoys manipulating him so much that she, like, crushes the child's hand while thinking about it. Ow! Ow! <sighs> the La Crusade team attacks once more before the Archangel can meet up with the Eighth Fleet, and I think this here is the first time that Kira gets his power up. Yeah, it's kind of weird for a Gundam show, but Kira and a few other characters possess the seed. While it's not very well explained in the series, just Think of it as the Super Mode from G Gundam, or like Kaioken from DBZ. 
When under duress, Kira loses the detail in his eyes and he gets hyper fast reflexes. And when in this mode, he's usually able to fight off the whole La Crusade team single handedly. Actually, it's, it's closer to Ultra Instinct now that I think about it. Kira wounds Izak in this fight, causing him to have a big ugly scar across his face. And this event becomes the sole focus of Izak's character until pretty late in the series. While I haven't talked much about them yet, the La Crusade team are much more than just goons out trying to stop the protagonist's ship. They're pretty well-developed characters in their own right, at least as far as Gundam Seed goes anyway. There's a large battle between the 8th Fleet and the Zaft Pursuit Force, and ultimately Admiral Halliburton, who is pretty much the only Alliance officer we've met who isn't a huge dickhead, essentially orders the Archangel to escape and descend to Earth. Romius does so knowing that they are sacrificing the entire fleet for the survival of the Archangel, but due to their incredibly valuable prototypes, they can't be lost. Kira fights Izak once more during the atmospheric re-entry, and Izak, thinking that the lifeboat full of civilians fleeing from the Archangel is full of soldiers, blows it the hell up. And I do have to give Gundam Seed props, they went through with full-on murdering a little kid in front of Kira. Kira wakes up in the medbay of the Archangel, relatively unhurt after his rough landing. Well, at least physically, because it's kind of at this point where Kira begins to struggle with the weight of everyone depending on him. When I said this show had a lot of crying, well, it has a lot of crying, and I mean like gasping, ugly crying. I couldn't... I couldn't save her. Oh. Kira. Flay doesn't help in the matter, as even though her and Sai were sort of a thing, she now wants that coordinator D. Thinking that having her on the ship will make Kira fight harder, Flay wants him to kill all coordinators, basically. The Archangel was unable to stay on course because of the battle in the atmosphere, so instead of landing directly at the Alaska base, they're knocked way off course and into North Africa. What follows is an arc that Gundam has done a few times, actually with the main group assisting some local guerrilla fighters against their shared enemy. I don't know why Gundam loves this trope so much, but here we are. We are reintroduced to Kigali, and while we still don't know exactly who she is or why she's here, she is completely dedicated to fighting Zaft in Africa, along with her buff bodyguard Ledinir Kisaka. Along with Kigali coming back into the story is a new enemy, Andrew Waldfeld the Desert Tiger who utilizes these mobile armors called Bakus that really remind me of Zoids. Since Seed is still hitting the notes of the original Mobile Suit Gundam, Waldfault acts as sort of a Ramba Rawl to Kira's Amuro. They even meet up at a cafe without knowing who each other are, at least Kira and Kigali don't know that he's the Zaft commander. While he isn't as charismatic as old Ramba Rawl and he doesn't have his memorable lines, Waldfelt is a pretty good foil to Kira and he's the first person that makes Kira think that maybe bloodshed isn't going to solve the war. Either way, the two characters know that eventually they will be forced into an inevitable confrontation and that feeling of stress and anxiety hangs over this arc for the entire duration. While Kira messes around in the desert, Atherin gets to go back home and visit not only his father, but also his fiancée, Lacus Klein. We learn that Atherin and Kira grew up on the moon together, with Kira being sent away by his parents to avoid the war. We also get some Zaft politics, as Atherin's father, Patrick Zala, and the current chairman of Zaft's council, Siegel Klein, have an argument about how the war should proceed, with Zala being far more aggressive with a coordinator supremacist mindset. Finally, a gap in the coordinator armor is shown as the audience learns that their birth rates are declining, and the further they get along generationally, the lower it becomes. We also get more of La Crusade taking meds and convulsing, as well as scheming with Zala over the phone. These scenes with La Crusade are a good way to make him a pretty interesting character, since he really does just bide his time through 90% of the series. Kira's inevitable confrontation with Waldfeld comes to a close as he destroys the commander's custom suit with his giant mobile suit knife. After this, the Archangel attempts to cross the Indian Ocean, still trying to make it to Alaska. 
The Archangel is harried by aquatic zaft forces while Kigali decides to travel along with them. Flay starts getting jealous that Kira and Kigali are spending time together, so she pulls her tits out and shoves them in Kira's face. Yeah, the um fan service in this show is not subtle. Unlike Flay, Kigali actually attempts to make herself useful by piloting one of the Sky Graspers along with Mula Flaga. Though she's not the best pilot and constantly overextends herself in battle, this all comes to a head as Kigali is separated from the Archangel and comes across a Zaft aircraft carrier transporting a newly returned Athrun and Aegis Gundam. Athrun is forced to eject in the Aegis and crash lands on the same island that Kigali crash lands on. There's a confrontation which ends in the two shooting at each other. Kigali almost drowns in a tide pool while tied up, and eventually her and Athrun are forced to cooperate. As they leave the island separately, they have a grudging respect for each other, if not a budding attraction. Kigali becomes more of a main focus as the Archangel comes close to the borders of Orb while under attack by the newly reunited La Crusade team. The Orb Navy threatens to blow them all up, and Kigali is forced to reveal that she is the daughter of Lord Izumi, the current leader of Orb. Also, by this point, Kira is such a good pilot, particularly when in seed mode, that he can pretty much fend off the entire La Crusade team himself. Izak, who still holds his grudge against Kira, constantly just gets dumpstered every time they meet up. The Archangel docks on an island facility owned by the Orb Company Morgan Road, the same company that constructed the G-Weapons on Heliopolis. Knowing that Orb is struggling to maintain its neutrality, Lord Izumi has a press conference and says the Archangel has already left their territory. Privately, he also maintains that he had no idea that Morgan Rote was constructing the Archangel and Gundams for the Alliance. Meanwhile, Athrun's team sneaks inside of the Orb facility, and he is absolutely sure that the Archangel hasn't left. Of course, he doesn't want the rest of the team to know that he was best friends with the pilot of the strike. Kira and Athrun meet face to face outside of the hangar, as Athrun gives back the robot bird that he built for Kira when they were friends. Yeah, I forgot to mention, Kira has a robot bird named Birdie that's kind of like this series Haro, even though Haro's also, there are a lot of Haro's in this show actually, what the fuck am I talking about? It's pretty much just used for this scene, Although it does fly around a lot, and at one point it attacks Flay, so that's kind of cool. We're introduced to a character called Erica Simmons, an orb investigator who goes over Kira's combat record with the strike. The reason I bring this up is because Erica is simply used as a framing device for a clip show episode. Gundam Seed has this stretch of episodes near the middle of its run where it plays clips of old events so often that it feels like the bulk of material in each episode is old content. As the series goes on, it definitely gets better, but this part really irked me during my watch through. I'm pretty sure there are flashbacks to events that happened within the same episodes at some point. Kira also helps Erika understand the Strikes OS, and probably the most important revelation throughout this entire arc in Orb is that Kira and Kigali are actually siblings. They just don't know it yet. We see Lord Izumi discuss this with Kira's parents in a meeting where he has to also be like, sorry, Kira became a one-man army, whoopsie, haha. This series of episodes also covers Kira's issue with going to visit his parents. All of his friends go and spend some time with their families in Orb, but Kira is at first reluctant to go see them, and then outwardly hostile towards the idea. Ultimately, we learn that Kira knows he would ask his parents why they decided to make him a coordinator, a pretty heavy question and one he knows he wouldn't be able to take back, and it would change their relationship forever. Honestly, it's heavy subject matter, and it's something that adds a lot of depth to Kira's character, and I think it was handled in a pretty good way. That was an aspect of Kira's character that I actually did enjoy. He's able to look inwardly and reflect upon himself. And while soon we'll see that he becomes a much less interesting version of that character, it's nice for the moment, at least. Oh yeah, also the Astray mobile suit built by Orb to be piloted by their defense force is pretty damn cool. In fact, it's such a cool design that it's got its own spin-off. Yeah, maybe we'll get to that someday, somehow. After being resupplied, the Archangel leaves Orb, with Kira being especially nervous knowing that Athrun is lying in wait. During the ensuing battle is one of the biggest and most important differences between the original broadcast version of Seed and its HD remaster. 
Originally, during the battle, Kira fights Athrun and Nicole face to face, taking the opportunity to intentionally strike a killing blow on the Blitz with his sword. In the remaster, Kira fights more defensively, and the way it's edited makes it look like Nicole just sort of runs into Kira's blade, which not only makes Nicole seem like kind of a dumbass, but it also takes the weight of that death off of Kira's shoulders. Narratively, it really feels like a cop-out and makes Kira's subsequent character development more hollow than it originally was. Because of this, the edit is sort of seen as a Han shot first situation within the fandom, and Kira killing Nicole intentionally is seen as the canon version of events. Kira also struggles with the fact that he killed the pilot of the Blitz, which rings a little hollow because up until now, Kira has killed a lot of people. I guess you could say it was the final straw though, and the stress of combat has been compounding that entire time. Either way, it's not long before Kira and Athrin meet up on the battlefield once more, and all thoughts of civility have gone completely out the window. The two former friends really are out for blood, and during the battle, one of Kira's friends, Toll, gets fucking decapitated while flying the Skygrasper. Kira and Athrin have a fight to the death, and it's probably the most intense and impressive fight in the entire show. Gundam Seed's animation can be... not great a lot of the time, but when push comes to shove, they still did great work. During the fight, Athrun grapples the strike and self-destructs the Aegis, blowing up both suits. When the crew of the Archangel recovers the strike, they find the cockpit completely melted. There's no way that Kira could survive, right? Well, he does, and it's not really explained. The next time we see him, he's recovering on one of the plants under the care of Lacus Klein. He was brought there in secret by a man named Reverend Malchius, who is a close confidant of the former Zaf chairman and father of Lacus. Okay, all of that's fine, I guess. I mean, the time scale is a little screwy because it should have taken a long while to get Kira to the plant, but maybe the show just wasn't good at that aspect. On the other hand, though, how in the mother of God did Kira survive the cockpit melting explosion? I guess it's been said after the fact that a blast shield came down in the last second to save Kira, but how did he survive the heat that melted the seat? His suit could hold up to that? I mean, the electronics are melted, man. Also, Jesus, it, that's an effective blast shield, damn. Either way, it's a cheap way to make him survive what should have been certain death, but it is what it is, and this event ushers in the back half of Seed. During this battle, the Buster is also damaged, and its pilot, Dirka, is captured and held aboard the Archangel. There's an absolutely insane plot point where Miri, while grieving over the loss of Toll, just tries to stab Dirka to death while he's in the med bay, and then Flay comes in and tries to shoot him. It's absolutely crazy. It even leads to Badgeril bitching out Ramius and finally telling her she's not a great captain, and Ramius' response is basically like, yeah, I know, well, what can you do, lol. The ship finally arrives at the Alaska base, and of course, the Alliance is pretty much just evil at this point, and they just transfer everyone that they think is useful off of the Archangel. Mu, because he's an ace pilot. Badgeril, because she's pretty much the only person on the ship that's willing to follow orders and do things by the book. And Flay, because she's the daughter of a deceased senator and would be incredibly good for propaganda. Zaf's Operation Spitbrick finally launches and their feint of attacking Panama base works, as they instead target the Alliance HQ at Alaska. During the attack, Mu and Flay run off into the base, sensing that something is amiss, and they come across La Crusade. Flay ends up getting taken hostage by the masked freak, and Mu ends up back on the Archangel, which finds itself attached to the Alaskan Defense Force and fending off the brunt of the Zaft forces. Mu tells Ramius that he discovered the top brass had sneakily evacuated, and they're planning on using an underground super weapon called the Cyclops system to destroy the Zaft fleet after luring him in. The Archangel decides to flee, and the system activates with a huge field of energy that blows up suits and ships on the contact, and just pops people, it's pretty gnarly. Suddenly, who else would arrive just in the nick of time to save the show's main ship but Kira, decked out in the state-of-the-art Freedom Gundam? Now, while all this has been going on with the Alaska base, Kira has been recovering on the plant and coming to terms with who he is and who he wants to be. Ultimately, he realizes that he's not a soldier of the Alliance, and his ultimate goal is to protect everyone from war by taking his own side. 
Now in a more grounded series, this might not really work, but in a show like Gundam Seed, where the Gundams, especially the mid-series upgrades, are so powerful, it kind of works. The final arc of the show really does just become a power fantasy, as Lacus believes in Kira's goal and gives him the Freedom Gundam, a brand new Zaft mobile suit built using the knowledge of the G-weapons. It's also equipped with an end jammer canceller, which allows it to use a nuclear engine. This pretty much eradicates the risk of running out of power mid-battle that permeated the first part of the show, and gives the Freedom a huge edge over almost every other suit. Lacus is now hunted down by Zaft forces, as she's seen as a traitor by Chairman Zala, and even her father is gunned down while they're looking for her. Athrin eventually finds Lacus in an old theater, and she tells Athrin that Kira is alive, which causes him to freak out. Lacus asks Athrin what it is he truly fights for, Zaft, or a world that's really worth living in. Goons break in, and it's revealed that Lacus has her own faction of soldiers inside the military, and in fact she ends up having quite a large faction of people loyal to her cause. I actually really enjoyed this turn of events. When I first watched Gundam Seed a few years ago, I really didn't like Lacus when she's first introduced. Her flighty and naive personality sort of annoyed me. Little did I know that she's actually a cunning leader and propagandist, and she schemes almost as much as the other leaders of the world factions. The Archangel makes it to the only place they could think to flee, the country of Orb, but their safety is short-lived as the Earth Alliance declares that anyone who's still claiming neutrality is actually on the side of Zaft. A new antagonist named Azrael shows up, and it's revealed that he is the leader of Blue Cosmos. We learn that La Crusade attacked the Panama base and destroyed the last mass driver that the Alliance owned, so now they're pretty desperate to get their hands on the mass driver at Morgan Road. They have brand new mobile suits called Daggers that can be piloted by naturals, and honestly, they stand up pretty well to the coordinator piloted Jins. But these new suits will be all but useless if they don't have a way to reliably get into space. Along with the Dagger, mobile suits are three of the edgiest and cringiest Gundam pilots ever to grace the series. We have Shani Andros, a green-haired psycho who pretty much only grunts to communicate and listens to terrible loud music on headphones. Though I think he does say, here's Shawnee once, which is a reference to The Shining, which means The Shining exists in Gundam Seed and so does Stephen King. I guess that makes sense, but it's kind of weird to think about. Okay, tangent over. Orga Sabnak is the worst character named Orga in the franchise and is also a leader of the trio, and he has a gruff voice in the dub. That's pretty much his personality. And then finally, my least favorite is the red-haired Clotho Booer. Buer? I don't know. Who's a gamer? <laughs> He's always playing a Game Boy in his limited off time, and he constantly shouts things like, Noob! and We Beat the Boss! in combat. I hate him most of all. These three pilot the Forbidden, Calamity, and Raider Gundams, respectively. And while these suits are kind of cool looking, they aren't used very well. While the Blitz, Buster, Duel, and Aegis all had separate abilities and roles during combat, even if the show doesn't do the best job of presenting that, the newly introduced suits are just sort of bland. I mean, yeah, they have specialties and differences, with the Forbidden Gundam being the weirdest of them all, but after this show's over, I probably won't remember them. On the other hand, I'll never forget how the Freedom looks, which is basically just the strike decked out with a million weapons. We're inching very close to double Zeta territory with that design. These three pilots are all edgy weirdos with paper-thin characterization, and the only interesting thing they really offer to the series is the implications that their backgrounds provide. These three are what the Alliance refers to as boosted men or biological CPUs designed only to pilot the Gundams, their mental health and stability be damned. Designed to be able to fight on the same level of the coordinators and overseen by a megalomaniac like Azrael, it's honestly impressive they can stand up to the likes of Kira at all. We even see that Azrael denies them pain meds for their incredibly intense headaches when they fail to destroy the freedom. This is a parallel to the Universal Century Timeline's Cyber New Types, which had similar stability issues, and this turn of events makes sense if you think of Seed as a modern adaption of the 1979 classic. To catch up with Athrun, he's transferred to the Zap Special Forces after his success at apparently killing Kira and destroying the Strike. 
He doesn't spend much time back at the Zaft homeland, however, as after he meets up with Lacus and she escapes, his father sends him on a secret mission. Atherin is given the Justice Gundam, a new machine with similar specs to the Freedom, and Jammer Canceler included, and is told to go and retrieve the Freedom. Not only that, but he's ordered to kill the pilot and everybody else who's come in contact with the suit, which is something that even Athrun is shocked by. He immediately takes the Justice and travels to Orb, arriving just in time to save the Freedom and the Archangel. Oh yeah, at this point the Strike is rebuilt and they installed the natural OS in it so Mu can pilot it, and it's awesome. Athrun reunites with Kira, and the two finally come face to face once more. However, now they're on the same side. After seeing how his father has become more and more extreme with his anti-natural views and questioning his own beliefs after talking to Lacus, he decides that defending Orb and essentially joining the crew of the Archangel is the right thing to do. While they aren't immediately trusting of Athrun, the crew of the Archangel is willing to take any help that they can get. We also see that Miri, who has started to move past the death of Toll after seeing Kira and Athrun make amends, lets Dirka out of the brig. While Dirka initially just leaves, when the battle breaks out, he returns to the ship and pilots a repaired Buster Gundam, also joining the Archangel crew. The Battle of Orb rages as Lord Azumi evacuates all his citizens to space, including Kigali. He gives her a picture proving that her and Kira are siblings, and then after everyone evacuates, he detonates the entire island, which is pretty ironic considering the Alliance literally just did the exact same thing. This act of defiance against the Alliance, that rhymes, costs Kigali her homeland and also her father, but hey, at least now she's got a brother who's also a Jesus stand-in. Yeah, I guess now it's time to talk about the biggest criticism of Gundam Seed. After Kira returns with the Freedom Gundam, he becomes almost an untouchable pilot. That's not really out of the ordinary for the Gundam franchise, but I think what bothers fans more is that he becomes almost infallible in both his goals and reasoning as well. He basically has no flaws for the last 15 or so episodes of Seed, which makes him pretty boring to watch after a point. Also, most people fall all over Kira and talk about how great and amazing he is. It just gets to be a bit much after a while, and calling Kira a Mary Sue at this point is totally fair. With the destruction of Orb, we're finally set up for the last arc of Seed, and of course, it all comes full circle and takes place in space. The Archangel and Kusanagi, helmed by Chikasa and Kigali, make it to space. Athron, having just gained the trust of Captain Ramius, asks to take a shuttle to go and talk to his father, which seems ultra sus, I do have to admit, but he is allowed to depart. Kigali also tells Kira that they're siblings, and honestly, this plot point just sort of fizzles out. Maybe I'm misremembering something later on, but it kind of just goes nowhere. Atherin returns to his dad, who's really pissed he doesn't have the justice or the strike with him, and ultimately he names Atherin a traitor and even goes so far as to shoot him after saying that genocide is the only way to win the war. It's a pretty sticky situation and I don't know how Atherin would get out of it until Lacus shows up and it's revealed that her faction is wound so deeply into the military that they steal a brand new warship called the Eternal, which by the way is helmed by a newly returned Andrew Waldfeld, who never really seemed like he went along with the ideals of Zaft anyway. Also. Hey, Kira, Waldfelt survived your fight in the desert, so you don't gotta feel bad about that one anymore. If only the, um, other 20 to 30 dudes you murked before that were a main character, too. The Archangel, Kusanagi, and Eternal rendezvous with the L4 colonies. These were colonies that were damaged at the outset of the war, and have since been abandoned. But, much like the trip to Junius 7 at the beginning of the show, they may hold valuable resources. Besides, they don't really have a plan, so they need a place to hide out because you can bet your ass that both the Alliance and Zaft are gunning for them now. The Eternal is revealed to have been designed to house the Freedom and Justice Gundams specifically, so Athrun and Kira transfer their suits over to that ship. You know, I actually really like this aspect of the ending of Gundam Seed. While there's plenty to complain about if you really want to, having the characters split off and follow their own ideals to form a third faction is a pretty interesting idea that hasn't been done very much. Not in this franchise in 2002, at least. Now it has. Gundam X notwithstanding, because most people haven't seen it. 
You should watch Gundam X, it's really good. The Alliance reveals a brand new warship called the Dominion, and yes, it does look like it came from the Mirror Dimension. It's a black and red evil version of the Archangel, and while that is kinda silly, I kinda like it. Honestly, they should have slapped a big mustache on it so we really knew it was evil. Azrael boards the Dominion alongside his biological CPUs and the three newly developed Gundams. In a twist that you probably saw coming from miles away, Bajoral is made the captain of the Dominion, and Azrael says that their new mission is to hunt down and destroy the Archangel. On the Zapped side of things, La Crusade is ordered to hunt the Archangel as well, and of course no one really cares that he's just like, got this young girl hostage. I know, I know, Shark clone and all, but no one's gonna say anything, really. Isaac is the only one who tries to bring it up, and La Crusade's response is basically just, eh, don't worry about it, pimp, we all got our side hustle going on. Much like the Universal Century's Char Aznable, Rao La Crusette is a triple S rank groomer psychopath, and at this point, Flay doesn't seem all that bothered to have been taken captive by him. At one point, she even like sees him as her dad, so that's something that happened. She even has a gun pointed at him at one point, and he just tells her like, if she shoots him, no one will even give a shit because no one cares if she's alive. Which is harsh, but true, I guess. And you know, I do not like Flay, and the series pushes you into that opinion of her pretty early on, but can you really blame Flay for being a little crazy at this point? She also has a chance to steal or tamper with La Crusade's medicine that he has to take near constantly, and she just doesn't. But Gundam Seed does a pretty good job of making you think that she might do it, just to give credit where it's due for the series writing. The Dominion and Archangel fight, with Kira and Athrin being pretty much untouchable at this point. That nuclear engine really comes in clutch, as the Alliance Gundams are still constantly dealing with running out of power. The Flaga and Dirka do some work in this fight too, which is always cool. I love seeing Mu pilot the strike, and while I haven't talked about Mu La Flaga much in this video, I think he's actually my favorite character in Gundam Seed. As a natural that can hold his own against coordinators in outdated mobile armor in one-on-one -on -one combat, Mu represents the peak natural human ability when it comes to piloting. And yeah, while Mu is a new type, which has been confirmed in interviews after the fact, he only ever really uses his new type abilities to sense where La Crusade is. So he's not using his new type crap to win, it's all skill when it comes to La Flaga, and I really like that. Not to mention that, so far in this franchise, he might be the best mentor character. It's kind of a toss-up with Jamil Neat from X, but as far as ace pilots that the MC looks up to, he's up there with Quattro Bagina from Zeta. So when we finally get the payoff with La Crusade and Mu inside the L4 colonies, it hits really well. Mu chases the masked villain inside, and because there's too much interference on the radio, the Archangel loses contact with him, prompting Kira to also enter the colony. Inside, we see that this particular colony houses a facility where coordinators were genetically altered at birth. Mu tells Kira not to listen to anything that La Crusade says, which is a pretty good idea because La Crusade reveals that Kira's real father was a man named Professor Hibiki, who created Kira from an artificial womb to be the perfect coordinator. Because this was a big scientific and ethical no-no, Kira was placed into hiding with his parents because Blue Cosmos wanted him dead. So yep, people joke and call Kira Space Jesus, but he literally is just a Jesus allegory and it's not even subtle. If the whole artificial womb thing wasn't a crazy enough revelation, La Crusade also tells them that he's a clone of Mu La Flaga's dad, who was a dude that was so self-centered that he wanted his kid to just be him. Sounds like Mu had a pretty stressful childhood. This scene really did a lot to elevate La Crusade as an antagonist in my mind. I know he's a fan favorite for Seed, but I have to admit for the first 90% of the show, I didn't really get it. But now, seeing him go absolutely fucking crazy, I get it and he's great. Also, props to his dub voice actor. And if that's all man is, then they should kill. Kill until they are drunk on blood! Enough! What gives you the right to decide? <laughs> Because I am what they made me! I am the only one who has that right to sit in judgment over all humanity! 
Oh my god, enough already! After all these revelations, La Crusade gets his mask knocked off, and then he runs back to his ship to put the final stages of his master plan into motion. He gives Flay a data disc and puts her in a lifeboat, telling her that if she gets that disc into the hands of someone in the Alliance, it will end the war. And then he just ejects her into the middle of the battle. Now, of course, Kira doesn't get a break, having learned that he is a weird, perfect test tube baby, and his mother is a cold, hard machine, and now he's got a rush to save Flay. Unfortunately, even Space Jesus can't catch a break here, and the freedom is damaged, with Kira being unable to get to Flay in time. Flay is brought aboard the Dominion, and the data disk is revealed to contain the plans for the Zaft built and Jammer Canceller housed inside the Freedom and Justice Gundams. Asriel has a great evil laugh to himself about this, and you might think, oh well now they can improve their mobile suits so that they don't run out of energy so fast. But nope, he jumps right to launching nukes at the Zaft homeland. Now, why would La Crusade want to hand the Alliance plans for the tech that gives them a huge edge in the war? Well, because one, he's totally insane, but like an evil calculating type of insane? And two, he wants to kill all phonies. So with the Alliance, um, peacemaker force mobilized and proven to be effective with the destruction of the Zaft stronghold of Boaz, the final conflict erupts at the Zaft homeland. Izak, still loyal to Zaft and working under La Crusade, defends the colonies from incoming nuclear missiles. Athrin and Kira show up just in the nick of time using their Gundams equipped with the incredibly fast meteor booster system. Chairman Zala reveals his ultimate plan, a giant space superweapon called the Genesis System that basically fires a gamma ray laser. It would not be a Gundam finale without a giant space laser, so I'm glad that that trope showed up. He fires the weapon and takes out a majority of the Alliance fleet, forcing them to retreat. This pisses off Azrael, so he orders Badgerel to regroup and attack the Genesis system, saying that reinforcements from the Lunar fleet will soon arrive. As the attack on the Genesis system commences, Lacus gives Kira a ring as a good luck charm, which kind of matches with Athrun having a charm as well from Kigali. Speaking of Kigali, she gets to pilot the newly finished Strike Rouge, which is just a red tinted strike. Honestly, I think this was kind of dumb, and went against her character development. Kigali realizes that her place is outside of battle in a leadership position slowly over the course of the series, and after she pilots the Sky Grasper back on Earth, she doesn't really directly take part in a battle again. Personally, I think it should have stayed that way, but whatever, fuck it. She gets a red tinted strike, I guess. Oh, and speaking of new Gundams, La Crusade gets the Providence Gundam, which is actually awesome, and he should have had way earlier in the series, in my opinion. Maybe I'm just a sucker for bits, but I love this suit. Mu battles his, um, dad, uncle, with the strike, but no matter his skills and new type perception, the old Gundam is just totally outmatched. He's heavily damaged in their battle and forced to limp back to the Archangel in retreat. Lacus realizes that if Zala fires the Genesis system at the Earth, it would basically kill everyone on the planet, so Ramius orders everyone to attack the weapon. Azrael finally orders the Dominion to destroy the Archangel, but they're saved by Flay warning them over the comms at the last second. Azrael tries to execute Flay, but Badrel fights with him. Flay and the crew abandon ship, and Badrel is shot multiple times before Azrael reaches the console and fires the main guns at the Archangel. Shockingly, Laflaga is able to block the cannon with the strike, saving the Archangel's bridge, but the strike is already heavily damaged and there's no way the suit can hold up. Mu leaves the Archangel Bridge with his final words. He makes the impossible possible, and then he's gone, the strike being completely destroyed. Let me tell you, I really loved this moment, and Mu's sacrifice is a well-earned and well-executed moment that really elevates the ending of Gundam C. It really would be a shame if, hypothetically speaking, something in the future caused this sacrifice to be completely irrelevant, but I'm sure that won't happen. Ramius grieves the loss of Mu by returning fire with a barrage that destroys the Dominion's bridge, taking Badgerel and Azriel with him. Flay and some of the Dominion crew are floating around in a lifeboat, and while Kira does his best to defend it from La Crusade's Providence Gundam, he's unable to, and the pod explodes. Flay comes to Kira in a vision so he can get one more good cry in before the end of the series, and she tells him that it's all okay, and now she feels unafraid and at peace. 
Kira goes into seed mode and fights La Crusade in a fierce battle. Inside Genesis, Zala orders his men to fire the Genesis system at North America, and when one of them refuses, he just shoots him. He goes to fire the weapon himself, but the guy he shot just mag dumps him. Thanks, random zapped guy, for saving the Earth. Kigali and Atherin show up and talk to him, and he's still petty and wants revenge. They evacuate the base, and it's set to self-destruct, just barely surviving the blast. Kira finally finishes his battle with La Crusade, resigning himself to claim a life for the sake of everybody else. In a final scene, Kira's robot bird flies through space, uh, don't ask me how that works, and is able to locate Kira, floating in his normal suit. I really love the last shot here, and it's one of the most hopeful endings of a Gundam show, leaving us with one final thought. The world is what we make it. This final line brings the series to a close, as Kira is reunited with his friends once more. And that's how the show ends. While it's a hopeful note, the Alliance and Zaft are pretty much in disarray, with enormous damage being dealt to both sides. Overall, Mobile Suit Gundam Seed wasn't really my favorite Gundam series. Hell, it's probably not even in my top five. However, I do think that Seed may be one of the easiest and most fun series that I've watched so far. Despite reusing animation quite a lot, especially when it comes to the Buster firing his big gun, which they recycle every episode, I found Seed very easy to binge watch. Its pace almost never lets up, and the show doesn't linger in one location for too long. Whether it's space, the desert, the ocean, Alaska, space again, Seed knows when to spice things up and to keep it from feeling like you're watching the same thing over and over, despite the fact that it's quite formulaic. Personally, I think that Gundam Seed is a pretty easy recommendation, especially to someone who's just getting into the series and doesn't want to watch something from the 70s. As long as they're able to put up with some iffy frames and early 2000s animation, and a lot of ugly crying, yeah, the story can be fairly silly and come off like a young adult novel at times, but then it will get incredibly dark out of nowhere, and some of the questions that Gundam Seed poses about what it means to be human and the cost of scientific advancement are certainly interesting. However, the writing and character dynamics are just a bit too shallow to handle these themes effectively. Yes, at the end of the day, I enjoyed Gundam Seed quite a bit. And besides a few episodes in the middle that relied on flashbacks way too much, it never felt like a chore to actually sit down and watch. The series definitely struck a chord with both Eastern and Western audiences, what with its multiple spin-offs and its fully animated sequel series. So yeah, next up on the Gundam retrospective is not Gundam Seed Destiny. No, we're gonna take a little break first. Instead, I will be looking at MS Igloo, the hidden one-year war. So thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, and we'll see you again real soon. Hey everyone, welcome to the end card. Wow, this one took a while, but I think it was worth it. I think this might be the best video I've ever done, honestly. Um, thank you so much to all the members that stuck around in that month, and almost a month and a half that I didn't upload anything. Uh, I, I really appreciate it, and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Yeah, Gundam Seed. I really enjoy Gundam Seed. I'm going to use this end card to say something probably incredibly controversial that a bunch of you are going to be mad at me about. Um, but the redub of Gundam Seed on the Blu-rays is infinitely better than the Ocean dub. I, <laughs> if you compare them side by side, just quality-wise and, like, inflection and emotion-wise, I don't know how you can say the old ocean dub is better. Uh, if you're gonna tell me the ocean dub is better, then I think you've just got like nostalgia goggles permanently stapled onto your head for that. Sorry, so yeah, redub's better. That's gonna piss people off, but hey, I never watched the ocean dub as a kid, so yeah, just uh, totally unbiased. I don't, I don't think I could watch the ocean dub. It's kinda, it's kinda trash, anyway. Thank you again for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. Next time we're going to do MS Igloo. And uh, I know some people have really been waiting for Space Runaway Ideon. So, Ideon is coming up. Don't you worry. I am, I am working on the script. 
as we speak. Anyway, that's going to be it. I'll see you next time.